everybody has to be forgiven. But you can't forgive what she really did to those men. These are the stories of terrible deeds. They would choose two or three victims a year and simply kill them. Of crimes written in blood on history's pages. She was just a conveyor belt of bodies coming in and out of there. Across time and across continents, something united these murderers. What they did was unforgivable, but they were clever. They shared a common ambition. She understood her market for death very thoroughly. They wanted money. Greed can become a monster that feeds on itself. And would do anything to get it. Even when they came here and didn't intend to spend the night, they stayed and they went back and got their money and came back. The business of deadly women. Money makes people do all kinds of things. Female profit killers tend to be very methodical. They plan out their crimes very well. Put a lot of thought into it and how they're gonna do it. How they're gonna get rid of the evidence. What stories are they gonna tell? Quite a bit goes into it. Oftentimes they're killing people close to them and they don't get caught for years. In a remote field in Norway stands a silent reminder of a deadly woman. It's not to celebrate her, but to mark where one of the worst female mass murderers in the world was born. For a century, residents of the small village of Selbu have lived in the shadow of their infamous resident, Belle Ganes. Headmaster Torget Storsheth has two great passions. One is teaching, the other his search for the truth behind the Norwegian serial killer. My father told me the story about Belganes. She was clever at school, but she might be characterized as an outsider among the children. So it might be an illustration that she was uh, uh, easily angered. In the late 19th century, an angry young woman left the chill of Norway for a new life in America's Midwest. Well, a lot of Norwegians went to America. We were a poor, poor country, and uh, they went to seek their fortune, uh, seek uh, new uh, opportunities. Torget has come to Laporte, Indiana, to solve the mystery preoccupying his village to this day. They are curious, I think. How could a woman from our area become a, one of the worst w female serial killers in the world. Hello. Welcome to the Port County Historical Society. Thank you. Good, Good, to, see you. Good to see you. Sylvia Author Bell. Sylvia Shepard has chronicled Bell's crimes and is anxious to share notes with a fellow seeker from Bell's hometown. It's been said that she probably killed in the 40s, close to 40. The pair meet at the local museum, where some of Bell's handiwork is kept. I understand that it is Scandinavian, because I had an archaeologist look at it, and he said from the forehead and the way that it's shaped that it was indeed Scandinavian. The skull's identity is unknown. And right here, it even says, found in the outhouse mm. at the Gunnis Farm. It could be any of the lonely men who strayed into Bell's trap.
she wanted Norwegian men, so she advertised in a, a, a Norwegian newspaper called the Scandinavian. See, many of these men had come over from Norway, and they wanted a woman, a wife, you know, somebody, companion. Belle was a good catch. She had profited from a string of insurance claims. She'd lost a candy store to fire. And two husbands in suspicious circumstances. Belle had 48 acres here. Chickens, pigs, you know. She advertised and said that she had all this. And she did have all that. She just didn't include what she did with the people. She had an allure. Many men came and thought they weren't going to be staying, but they did. In 1908, one victim to fall for Bell was Norwegian Andrew Helgelein. He was just one of those people that answered one of her ads. Convinced his future would be here with Bell, Andrew surrendered his life savings, $3,000. She kept men here, even when they came here and didn't intend to spend the night, or they stayed, and they went back and got their money and came back. By the time Andrew Helgelein settled in Laporte, Belle had three foster children to raise. The farm's income was modest, so her new man's savings were a windfall. But this homely scene was a prelude to death. Female serial killers frequently use poison as their weapon. Former FBI criminal profiler Candace DeLong, with 20 years experience, recognizes Bell's business plan. They don't have to get close to the victim. They just have to get close to their food. And strychnine is something that one would expect to see on a farm. Strychnine was commonly used as rat poison. Strychnine is a phenomenal compound. It comes from the seed of a tree in India. Forensic pathologist, Dr. Janice Amatuzio, based in Coon Rapids, Minnesota, knows strychnine's inevitable result. It antagonizes or stops the inhibitory reflex so that all of the reflexes of, of the stronger muscles, the flexor muscles, are, are exaggerated. Hope you like this. What an individual who takes strychnine will feel is initially perhaps a sense of anxiety or nervousness. Then they'll notice muscle twitches and muscle spasms. And then they actually get into a, a almost a seizure-like state where they have convulsions. These contractions are painful. And the victim is conscious throughout this whole process and probably terrified. It would take two types of people to be able to watch that. A sadist would probably enjoy it, or a cold-hearted individual for whom killing was no big deal. The greater gain, getting their money, was worth whatever they had to do to get it. But Bell's treachery would go much further. It would rank among the most grisly crimes in Indiana's history. In the 1880s, in Liverpool, England, a group of women ran an extraordinary cooperative. I think everyone is familiar with the concept of women sticking together in times of trouble, but you normally assume that it's going to be a helping in a, in a pleasant way.
Retired police prosecutor Angela Braben spent a lifetime fighting crime in English courts. But the case that fascinates her most happened before she was born. You've got a group of women living together and they're forming a web, a syndicate of murder, and they're investing in death. The plan was simple. Ensure everyone in their immediate acquaintance, then kill them one by one. There were four women who were actually killing. And then there were five or six others who were concerning themselves solely with the insurance. The women's cunning netted them a small fortune and turned the British insurance industry upside down. I admire them in a strange sort of way. They worked out the insurance rates, how would, how would they get the best rates for different people. They knew all the rules and regulations of the insurance and burial clubs, virtually backwards as far as I could work out. Together, they formed a predator pack. More common among male perpetrators, the female pack can be just as formidable. The pack mentality can certainly take over in a situation where you have a um, number of perpetrators with a common goal to obtain money. That money makes people do all kinds of things. No one was spared. Siblings, husbands, strangers, like young boarder, Maggie Jennings. There's probably one person in the group that's the leader, the alpha female. The one who came up with the idea, who drew up the plans, who gave the orders. And everybody else pretty much followed in line. In Liverpool, the pack's leader was Catherine Flanagan. Second in command, her sister, Margaret Higgins. Their method, poison. Arsenic obtained from flypapers. It was very readily available. All little shops would have the flypapers. You'd soak them in water and obtain a liquid, which then could very easily be added to the food. And women being the ones who provide the food, they could mix what they wished. Chronic ingestion of small amounts of arsenic gives very unusual symptoms. It might be the onset of intermittent abdominal pain, diarrhea, numbness and tingling in the extremities. Arsenic was not only easily available to the Liverpool Sisterhood, its symptoms were much like common illnesses of Victorian England. The slums of Liverpool at the time would have been hideous places. There was no public sanitation. There wasn't running water. People were crowded into small areas, and disease is a very natural outcome to those circumstances. No suspicions were raised when victims like Maggie Jennings died in the prime of life. The doctors were expecting to find the diseases of poverty, malnutrition, and uh, insanitary conditions. The women, therefore, made sure that the doctors found something that would fit with what the doctors were expecting. With every death came an insurance payout to one of the group to be later shared. Maggie Jennings, for example, was insured for over 112 pounds, and those insurances were started approximately 12 months before she died. So that was a very good rate of return for an investment. A good return indeed, when a laborer's weekly wage was less than a pound, not even a couple of dollars. With premiums of just a few pennies a month, Unscrupulous citizens could use England's life insurance companies for murderous gain. The insurance man would go to, from house to house and 
penny here and twopence there. And overall, one must assume that the insurance companies made a profit. Um, but I suspect that in this particular area of Liverpool, they probably made a loss. The women in the Liverpool syndicate were illiterate, but that didn't hinder business. Insurance brokers at the time were eager to sign up customers for their own commissions. They would be paid one year's premiums as their commission. So obviously the more people they could be um, encouraged to insure, the better. And if somebody was not sure about the right answers, they would make the answers up as they went along. This confluence of poison, poor hygiene, and exuberant sales pitches created the perfect storm of murder. Victims were chosen depending on how old they were, were they ill, could they be hastened, could they get insurance for them, and if so, how much. And they would choose two or three victims a year and simply kill them. Greed can become a monster that feeds on itself. And it's one of the toughest things in the world to keep a lid on. The Liverpool Syndicate operated undetected for at least four years. Their final tally would shock the country. It's very complicated to explain who killed who. And so this is a little diagram which, which shows you've got the two sisters here. Certainly, they killed Thomas Higgins. That's one husband gone. They probably killed the other husband, John Flanagan, as well. They certainly killed a son, a daughter-in-law, daughter-in-law's mother, a lodger, a little stepdaughter of 12, neighbors, friends, anyone else, really, that they could get their hands on. It's believed the syndicate murdered at least 17 people for profit. If there was any remorse, it seemed lost in a web of shared liability. In a gang or a pack committing a crime, whether it's one crime or several ongoing crimes, the sense of guilt, if there is any, is uh, definitely shared. And it's something that one member of the group can take some kind of comfort in knowing, well, I didn't really do this alone. I was the group. The power of the group can be very, very strong. In 1883, after four years, the group's power was finally extinguished. A suspicious relative convinced authorities to test the body of Margaret's husband. Police found arsenic, then pieced together a long trail of death. Enough evidence was found to convict Catherine Flanagan and her sister, Margaret Higgins. Newspaper reports describe how they hung side by side from the gallows. The others escaped prosecution. A shocked government clamped down on insurance practices fearing the Liverpool syndicate was just part of a poison epidemic. The effect on the government was like dynamite because they realized that this was not a very small scale murder confined to one area of one city. They realized that it was probably happening all over the country in similar areas. Just as shocking to the English public, was the fact the Liverpool women could kill those near and dear to them, even a child. In Laporte, Indiana, Belle Ganesse seems to have shared that chilling facility. Belle's story took a mysterious twist one spring evening. There was a handyman that was in that house, and when he went to bed that night, the occupants of the house were Belle and three children. The fire began at about four o'clock in the morning. 
The Ganesh farm was raised, its occupants consumed. The only survivor, Bell's handyman. When they got down through the ashes into the basement, there were four bodies here, three children and a female. And there was more. Investigating the fire scene, workers noticed soft spots around the farm and began to dig. They would find all of the victims wrapped in gunny sacks, parts of them. They had been all dismembered, fit into these sacks with lime. There were uh, children that were in her care, and of course the men who came to uh, visit her and never got away. Among the victims would be Andrew Helgeline, the partner wooed from Norway. They found him in a garbage pit where Bell had carried garbage, fish heads, tomato cans. It smelled terrible. That was the excuse for the smell. <laughs> Other human bones suggest the Ganesh farm pigs helped conceal further victims. I think the fact that Belle threw the body parts of her victims into a pig trough is a pretty good indicator as to the type of person that she was, how she felt about these men that she killed. What kind of final send-off is that for someone that was a human being to throw their body parts in a pig trough? Well, that's the kind of person she was. She didn't care. That's where she thought they belonged. Altogether, 14 bodies were found, including Belle's foster children. Probably she had given poison to her three children and, uh, and killed them maybe with a hammer blow too, because there was uh, uh, found holes in their skull uh, after the fire. Uh, how could a mother do a thing like that? There's another mystery. Did Belle perish in the fire? The only adult female body left few clues. At that time, they thought it was Belle dead in the fire. But the body was smaller than Belle's. And inexplicably, the skeleton was headless. There is no logic to the fact that there were her children's skeletons intact, and then the one adult skeleton, which one would think would be hers, the head is missing. And the head, of course, would be the one part of a skeleton that had, would have the most identifiers. Was this just another of Bell's insurance scams? Torgette's search for the truth is not yet over. As any business person knows, if you can match service with customer need, there's opportunity for profit. For Amy Archer Gilligan, that opportunity came with the elderly. Amy Archer Gilligan presented herself to the world as this very innocent Christian woman projecting this veil of, uh, of just a caretaker who wanted to take care of the sick and make a living at it. Investigative journalist M. William Phelps believes Amy's customers were sold the perfect pitch. You know, in today's economy, today's marketing, she would have been an expert marketer. What she should have had was a sign out front, really, that said, elderly care for life, as long as you don't die first. In 1907, in Connecticut, Amy was ahead of her time, launching one of New England's first nursing homes. She was a pioneer of elderly care at the turn of the century in New England. She kind of pioneered this whole idea of nursing uh, elderly people, which later turns into convalescent homes, this kind of thing. Seniors like Franklin Andrews signed up for a peaceful, caring home in which to spend their twilight years. The marketing ploy was 
$1,000, and I give your relative, your elderly person, life care. And life care meant they stayed in the home, she took care of them, fed them, clothed them, gave them medicines. There was no time limit. As long as the customers lived, Amy promised to care for them. You know, it seemed too good to be true, and people lined up. Clients and their families hoped for a long and restful life. But Amy's business plan called for something else. Turnover. Let's set the scene. Picture a calm and peaceful New England night. Patients are readying themselves for bed. They've just finished dinner. You have Amy Archer Gilligan in the kitchen mixing up a batch of warm lemonade. And warm lemonade at the time was an elixir for if you had the flu or you had an ailment. Amy kept her overheads down and vacancies up with arsenic. She understood her market for death very thoroughly. Her whole marketing genius was get the person in there, let them stay there for maybe a month, knock them off, and she's got $1,000 in her pocket. It sure beats changing bedpans for a living. Amy's calculations went further. To conceal evidence of her poisoning, she counted on an old mortuary practice. Well, basically, embalming fluids were preservatives, and they contained alcohols, formaldehyde, and they often contained a number of heavy metals like arsenic. Embalming, of course, being done prior to any post-mortem examination or prior to any specimens being taken for toxicology. Amy had a near-perfect cover. Elderly clients were expected to die sooner rather than later. And if there were any suspicions, forensic tests would be contaminated. Amy was very good at marketing and business. She would sell a bed to the patient, kill them, and probably have someone lined up to take that bed before that patient even was taken to, to the morgue. They dubbed it a murder factory because she was just a conveyor belt of bodies coming in and out of there. But Amy's business plan had a fatal flaw. Medical records of the time may have misrecorded the cause of death, but they could not hide the number dying under Amy's care. The returns of death certificates to the office of the Windsor Town Clerk show that there have been 60 deaths at the Archer home since the place opened in the fall of 1907. Over time, a case mounted against Amy Archer Gilligan but police needed evidence. They had a lot of circumstantial evidence that they were beginning to uh, incorporate some forensic evidence of doing some exhumations into it. Franklin Andrews' body was exhumed and tested positive for arsenic. No surprise for an embalmed body of the day, but there was one anomaly. Well, they found his stomach loaded with arsenic enough to kill several men. That was the quote. Such levels could only have come from ingestion. Right here, the Hartford Current reports, it is the belief of the authorities that the wholesale murders have been committed at the Archer home. Amy was convicted of murder and declared insane. She spent the rest of her life in an asylum By the time she died, arsenic embalming fluid was banned.
justice should have caught up with Norwegian serial murderer Bell Ganes in Indiana. But did it? By 1908, Bell's American adventure had come to a grisly end. Fourteen bodies were found on her farm, many chopped into pieces. Townsfolk were desperate to know what happened. Hello. Welcome to LaPorte, Indiana. Thank you very much. In the circuit court. The Bell Gunness case is something that is probably a major part of the history of this whole town. Judge Robert Gilmore's predecessor presided over LaPorte's most infamous trial. The skeletons were in somewhat of a fetal position, somewhat clenched. The fire's heat might explain it, but skeletons buried beyond the flames were also contorted. And then the argument became whether or not it may have been strychnine that caused the bodies to clench and get into the fetal position. <clears throat> Strychnine, basically what it does is it causes the stronger muscles to overcome the weaker muscles. So the hand will flex at the wrist, the arm will flex at the elbow, and the elbow will flex at the shoulder. And likewise, the legs. The legs will contract and flex in a position such as this. Strychnine was confirmed in the stomach of Norwegian lodger Andrew Helgeline. Bell was exposed as a murderer. But there was one more mystery. Did the serial killer perish? The whole trial centered around whether or not, in fact, it was the body of Bell Gunnis that they found in the remains of the fire, or whether, in fact, it may have been some other third party, we know not who. In this courtroom in 1908, jurors heard how the headless body seemed too small for Bell's large frame. One theory was the fire had shrunk the body. Well, you know, they tried to say that just like a roast, this body cooked up and got skinny then, you know, the skinnier than Bell was. But the children were still the same size, and their heads were all down there. Despite conflicting evidence, Jurors found the headless body was Bell Ganes, but many believed otherwise. And 23 years later, there was one more twist. For three decades, Ellen Penny has kept a secret. I remember every little detail about everything to do with this. Always have because I've relived it all my life, over and over. Today, she wouldn't change her loving family for the world, but in 1967, her dreams were elsewhere. We may have gone on and got married like we thought we would, but he didn't get that chance. And not because God chose to take him, but because his mama did. At 15, Ellen was falling in love for the very first time with 16-year-old Melvin Gibbs. The affair bloomed under the watchful eye of Melvin's mother, Janie. She was big in the church and she was big in all of the activities. But their love would be cut short by murder. Janie's three sons had already lost their father to a mystery illness. And it seemed Melvin could be next. He started having bad headaches. He would turn real pale, and his features would look drawn, and the whites of his eyes would get real, real red. 
He was never one to make a big deal out of it. And I'd say, you have a bad headache, don't you? And he'd say, yeah. But they started getting a lot more frequent. Melvin's constant headaches didn't stop his blossoming relationship with Ellen. Melvin gave me a surprise birthday party, my last birthday before he died. I was given this diary. But the lovebird's future would be confined to a box of memories. Mm. Melvin's headaches became worse. Mm. Doctors were perplexed. Janie was not. She was poisoning her son with mild doses of arsenic. If it's given over a period of time, individuals will have a variety of symptoms, and the doctors won't diagnose it unless they think of it. They are very slowly being killed while the medical community, the physicians, are just watching to see what happens. Only two people knew the true story, Janie and her son. And just as I got to the door, I heard Melvin holler, you did it. He did it. And Melvin was sitting up in the bed, looking right at her. And his pillow was laying on the floor in front of her. And then said, did you hear that? Did you see what he did? And she said, I don't know what it is I'm supposed to have done. Melvin's outbursts were put down to delirium. but soon he would be silenced, right under his doctor's noses. She went to the little pitcher of water they always have in the hospital room and poured that water out and poured hers in. She said that the water there had too much sulfur in it to burn his throat. In a cruel twist, Janie deceives her son's sweetheart into the final act. As she kept saying, Ellen, give him some more water, give him some more water. His throat's dry, give him some more water. That water, Ellen now realizes, was laced with arsenic. I was there with my hand on him, and you could feel his heartbeat. And then just all of a sudden, nothing. Just completely stopped. I don't really blame myself. But I think that she got some kind of perverse pleasure. Melvin's life insurance paid handsomely, as would policies on every other member of Janie's family. Her husband, three sons, and a grandson. All would die of a mystery illness. With each life insurance policy collected, Janie Gibbs' lifestyle improved. Afterwards, you hardly ever saw her in the same dress twice. She bought a new car, bought a house. Janie also shared her gains. We were building a new church, and I was told she donated $10,000, but she donated different amounts at different times. Donating the large sum of money to the church may have been a way to assuage her guilt, if she had any guilt. And it simply could have been a very calculating move to not be suspected of anything. 
but as her family died around her, people were suspicious. I think there was a lot of people that were starting to be suspicious, but if you're wrong, you know, this is Janie Gibbs, she's the pillar of the church. And what kind of monster are you for making an accusation like that against her? But five deaths in the one family proved too much for police. They exhumed the bodies for testing. Well, what we're looking at is the autopsy report on Melvin Gibbs, and this was performed on January 18th, 1968, and it happens to have been an exhumation autopsy. Now, it's important to realize that in some individuals, there will be a very minute amount of arsenic, just normally found in tissues. What was found in his uh, liver and kidney was at least 20 times the amount normally found. The levels here are sufficient to have caused death. Janie was convicted on five counts of murder and sentenced to life. But there would be one more discovery, making Janie's murders an even greater family tragedy. And this is the greatest tragedy. This is on par with the deaths of the people. Frank Martin was Janie Gibbs's defense lawyer. He believes his client's motivation was not for profit. He learned that before she murdered her family, Janie had a fateful appointment. Janie had gone to a doctor in Albany, Georgia, because she wasn't feeling well. The doctor diagnosed her with Lou Gehrig's disease. Lou Gehrig's disease destroys muscle control. It's always fatal. Janie went back home with her very fundamentalist beliefs. She decided she would send her husband, her children and grandchildren on to heaven in advance because she knew she was gonna die and she was just gonna send them ahead so they'd all be reunited in heaven. In LaPorte, Indiana, the crimes of Belle Guinness paid handsomely. When they tried to tally up how much money she might have gotten because this was all about money, uh, they thought it was probably close to $52,000, which would have been hundreds of thousands today. We're standing at the grave of Andrew Helgeline. He was the last male victim that Bell killed here. As Norwegian Torget Sturseth pays respect to his countrymen, he struggles to find forgiveness. Everybody has to be forgiven, but you can't forgive what she really did to those men. She had to be sick or, or uh, mentally ill in a way, I don't know. I think there was a lot more motivating Bell than simply money. And I think that's exhibited in the method of death that she chose, a painful poisoning. Then, chopping up their bodies and throwing the body parts into a pig trough shows utter contentment for men. I would say it was men in general she had a problem with. Maybe hated men because the father abandoned her, as the rumor says. Torget still has questions. The biggest of all, was Bell really killed in the farm fire? There was a real division within the community as to whether or not she died in the fire or whether she uh, escaped and basically was uh, on the run. I absolutely believe that she escaped. The head was never found to that fam female body. Uh, she had a whole week to get away between the time when the fire was discovered 
and then the uh, first body in the ground was discovered. 23 years later, a local newspaper speculated that this Californian murderer, fitting Bell's projected age, could be her. Then they sent a picture back here, taken in a very strange pose with her hands like this. Well, why would you take a picture that way? I think that's why she did it. She's clever. If Bell did feign her death, there could well have been more victims. It is unlikely that her murderous behavior would stop. Being a fairly young woman at the time, less than 50, she was into it. So I'm guessing she simply relocated and resumed her activities elsewhere. Many in the Liverpool syndicate survived prosecution, but new insurance laws put an end to their business. I think that this case resulted in a lot of the policies that we see today. For example, if I was running a boarding house, renting out rooms, I could not get a life insurance policy on the guy that I'm renting out to room 103. I have no what's called insurable interest in him. Someone has to have an insurable interest in an individual now to get a life insurance policy, and the individual being insured has to sign for the policy. Amy Archer Gilligan left a legacy too, helping create nursing homes, now a common concept across the United States. You know, when you look at Amy Archer Gilligan from the outside, she was really an entrepreneur of her day. She really was. But when you look beyond that, and you look at the facts and the evidence, you see someone who was shrouded with evil. On the face of it, they killed for money, for economic survival, or handsome profits. But for criminal profiler Candace DeLong, there was probably something more. One of the things that always comes to my mind when we are looking at female serial killers who say they just did it for the money, I have to ask myself if they weren't also enjoying the killing because it becomes what almost appears to be a compulsive behavior again and again and again doing something as serious, the most serious behavior in our society, criminal behavior, taking someone's life. For Janie Gibbs, the compulsion to consign her family to heaven proved doubly tragic. After all the killing, Janie learned her doctor's diagnosis was wrong. She wasn't fatally ill. Instead of heaven, Janie went into custody, where she remained for nearly 40 years. 